Following World War I, Western Electric Assistant Chief Engineer E.B. Kraft was charged with the task of developing new sound technologies for film. He split his team of sound and electrical engineers into two groups. One group was led by condenser microphone inventor Edward Wente, along with Irving Crandall and Donald McKenzie. This group explored the area of optical soundtracks on film. The other group, headed by J.P. Maxfield, developed the Vitaphone and its playback system. Of all of the inventions to come out of this effort, two stand out as essential to future sound system exploration, an improved condenser microphone and room acoustics research. Wente had patented his condenser microphone in 1916. Its increased frequency range allowed for better fidelity in recording to either disc or film. While working with his team, Wente was able to refine his invention to give recordings an even truer representation of original sound. His work revolutionized the radio and recording industries and versions of the condenser microphone are still used in recording today. J.P. Maxfield's team developed the Vitaphone recording and playback technologies, but no one had yet explored how microphones and speakers interacted with an actual room. To make his playback system work in theaters, Maxfield had to become a pioneer in the field of acoustics research. He was the first to propose lining the walls and ceilings of a theater with alternating boards to reflect sound, a technique still used in concert hall design. He did this to reduce the muddiness coming from multiple speakers in this new world of amplified sound. He also thought about the human head and human ears and how we perceive sound. This was a departure from the tendency to view sound as a point-to-point -point system, as a telephone company might. Maxfield tried to put sound back into proper 3D space, just like it exists in the world. To learn where Bell Lab scientists took this research in 1930, here's birthplace of the sound motion picture. this looks like just another unromantic New York skyscraper, it is really the birthplace of the modern speech and sound motion picture. Here in the Bell Telephone Laboratories of New York City, there are scientific workers continuously engaged in developing and perfecting the equipment and methods for this revolutionary new art. This is one of a number of interesting rooms, especially built to provide conditions most favorable to the study of sound. Here is an experimental microphone through which the sound may be sent to any other room desired. Walls are constructed to absorb the sound. The ceiling is also deadened and see the give to the floor raised from the floor of the building and resting on points. But like all other rooms, it is a busy place and visitors must not linger. Anyway, there's much more to be seen. However, on the way out, let us look quickly at this door. It shows the wall construction. First a prepared fiber, then wood, next metal, more fiber, and of course an airspace. But the test's beginning, and as they need every moment, we don't want to hold them up. with a special microphone panel set at proper distance from the piano and the player ready, the microphone may be turned on, making sure, of course, that the operator outside is ready to receive. Let's go.
This particular test shows a record on a delicate instrument of average sound pressures. The dial is set to go at 15 second intervals. At the end of 15 seconds, the needle rests that the observer may note the maximum. Many notes like this give him a good average to study. The interval over, the needle begins again as before. Here is another way they study sound pressures. This time the sound will come out of a loudspeaker of the usual theater type. The actual sound is a typical radio squeal made by an oscillator outside. This curious instrument is a swinging microphone so mounted that it always faces the sound. Being in the direct path, it catches all pressures from which uneven qualities in the loudspeaker, for instance, may easily be discovered. This test is but one of many to which loudspeakers are subjected. As they investigate qualities that the ear cannot detect, so do they check irregularities that the eye cannot see. Preparing to photograph through a microscope a tiny piece of the sensitive new metalloid, duralumin, used for microphones and light valves. This is called the visual light method of microscopic photography. The enlarged image may, of course, be seen with the eye, but it is a great advantage to have the photograph. From this room come many of the newest ideas in sound recording. He is cutting a wax such as is used in Vitaphone production and in the playback. Sue took father's shoe bench out. She was waiting at my lawn. Let's look into this. I eat pea soup at 6.15. Sue took father's shoe bench out. She was waiting at my lawn. I eat pea soup at 6.15. Sue took father's shoe bench out. These engineers are perfectly sane. When those words register, so will any others in the dictionary. And here's a sound test room where they play the disc on a regular theater projector. Vitaphone, using the synchronized disc method, was, as you all know, the first great sound picture sensation. First the projector, then the disc. is the sound track method, where the sound is recorded on the side of the film by this light valve. What looks like a wire is really a tape, six one thousandths of an inch wide and three ten thousandths of an inch thick, made of duralumin. The present photograph is remarkable in showing it so clearly. This tape vibrates with the voice from the microphone. And when the film, and when the loop rather, is put between the film and a strong light, the voice actually photographs itself. The light valve must be adjusted under a microscope because the duralumin loop in its final form is just a slip two one thousandths of an inch wide and one quarter of an inch approximately long. If you held it against the light, you would just barely be able to see it.
The sound track gets microscopic examination too. Francis F. Lucas examining its distribution of silver grains by ultraviolet light. Francis Lucas is one of the world's leaders in microscopic photography. To find the best materials, they try to wear them out. Before stopping, one of these two pieces will be rubbed through. Over where this engineer is going is a fatigue test for some lead sheathing. When the breakdown comes, an automatic counter will give the number of revolutions. Now that he isn't looking, it'll probably break. What did I tell you? Let him work it out for himself while we go over to that waving thing in the far right-hand corner. It's what they call a bend test. To understand it, come closer. It's giving. Watch closely. There it goes. and the impact test to see how hard a blow a piece of metal can stand. And these are only high spots in a large department. Here's one way they study the effect of the shape of a loudspeaker. The loudspeaker is on the floor with a microphone on top of it. The things in the background are just amplifiers. The sound shows in an oscillograph. The microphone is moved over the sound area, and if the loudspeaker is defective, the oscillograph shows when the microphone reaches the spot. At the Bell Telephone Laboratories, they call this the Flanders Horn Test. 